Hello and welcome back to Stephen C Ministries. Today's episode is both really interesting and God glorifying. Today we have on Beck. Beck discusses her experience of the New Age movement, the Theosophical Society, and even growing up Mormon, and ultimately how that all led her to knowing Jesus. I pray that you will find today's content useful, and I trust that you'll enjoy it. Thanks for watching. So, Beck, I want to thank you so much for coming on today, uh, coming on the podcast and being willing to share a little bit more about your story. I understand for you that that starts uh, in your experience uh, growing up as a Mormon. So maybe you could share a little bit about what that was like for you. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me, Stephen. This is, um, yeah, been looking forward to this. Um, so, yes, I was raised in the Mormon Church or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I will refer to it as a church, even though, because um, that's the way the world knows it, but I I actually view it more as like an organisation, a multi-level kind of marketing um, organisation. Um, so we, my parents were Mormon before I was born. Um, they stopped going um, for a few years there. And then when I was about seven, we started attending again. And for me, it was really exciting. Um, we grew up, I'm the youngest of eight. And so we, just to because my dad worked so much and my, my parents were so focused on paying off their house, it was exciting to go somewhere on a Sunday because we didn't often have that and we always got to wear our best clothes and it was like a big deal. And I also always noticed when we walked into the church, I mean, number one, that the church was very happy to have my parents back uh, and I think that's true of any church family. If someone has an absence, you're always excited to see them come back. Um, but I would always notice the, the treatment that we got there um, my dad would always lead us in and we had a spot almost at the front of the ward. So they call it a ward, um, at the front of the church and people would stop and stare and look at us. And, oh, look, you know, our family's coming through. It's almost like they saved a spot for us. As I've gotten older, I understand that's because we had what is held in very high esteem in the Mormon church, which is a large family. Um, and we had that traditional kind of, um, structure, um, similar structure that we see in Christianity. My, my dad was the lead, the spiritual leader of the house um, and my mum was very active in um, the Relief Society, so like the, the, the women's kind of work. My dad was um, very involved in uh, the priesthood blessings and all the rest of it. So we were esteemed um, and I liked that. <laughs> I liked having people that, you know, just fawned over our family a little bit. Because the truth of it was that our family had a lot of um, what I realise now was spiritual warfare. Um, so while we started attending the church, um, on the outside I feel that we looked really, you know, quite um, like a, a good family, um, but we had a lot of problems internally, um, a lot of problems that I think are tied to the fact that we were involved in a false mystery religion. Um, when I was eight, I was baptised into the Mormon church uh, Mormons believe that before the age of eight, you're incapable of sin. So um, they don't believe that that uh, we're all born into sin. And so when I was baptized, I was baptized by my brother. Again, I would say that was a beautiful experience. I was asked if I wanted to be baptized and I agreed. Um, something I've talk, talked about to, with my parents since um, because I didn't really know what I was doing, but they maintained that I had, you know, uh, showed an understanding and so, you know, there's no, there's no hard feelings about that. Um, I said that I wanted to, and I do remember that it was a really happy day and my brother baptised me. Um, that was when sleep paralysis started for me, <laughs> which I think is very interesting now when I look back on it. Um, my, my brother, as, as we got older, my eldest brother got more and more involved and he actually went on a two-year mission like lots of Mormons do. I think usually, well, when I was a child, it was only the men that really went on their missions, usually when they're about 18, 19. Um, but as I understand it, that's changed and, and women go on missions as well, but just for a shorter time. Um, he came back a different person. And in fact, by the time he came back, uh, my parents had decided to not attend church anymore. I don't know what the full story is. Um, so far as I can tell, there was a disagreement on some theological things between my father and the bishop. Um, so we had a four-year, five-year period of not attending, but we did all the things at home. My dad became essentially like our bishop in the home, kind of like a home church. So within the Mormon church, we do um, family home evening every Thursday 
and family meetings every Sunday. Uh, my dad would read to us from the Bible. We also had all the other Mormon books, um, Doctrines and Covenants, Book of Mormon um, and the others. I don't recall my dad really reading to me from those. But the things I learned at Sunday school when we were attending um, were what I now see very contrary to the Christian worldview. So I, I was taught that Jesus was uh, Lucifer's brother. Um, I was taught that God physically came down onto earth uh, to make Jesus with Mary. It wasn't an immaculate conception. Um, I was taught that I existed before I was born um, with Heavenly Father and um, Great Mother, as they would call her, um, before I was born into this earth. And I was taught that it's um, that their whole doctrine is one of exaltation. So their, their point is to exalt themselves to a point where they also can be gods of their own planet. So to me now, it makes sense as to why I, as an adult, made the jump into new age because there are some parallels. Um, and the, the, the big one is that belief in pre-existence. You find that a lot in the new age and also reincarnation. Another one being that Jesus isn't God, but more like an ascended master. So Jesus exaltated in the Mormon church and within the new age, they just say, well, he was just a really enlightened being. Um, and so it makes sense to me that I kind of went from one to another. They looked really different for me at the time, but now looking back, there was definite parallels between the two. Um, another one being that the Mormon church view the fall or Eve eating the fruit as a good thing because that can lead us to enlightenment, which is the lie that was told in Genesis 3. Um, and the new age is the same thing, that that was a good thing. And without that, we wouldn't be enlightened. So, yeah. <laughs> right. That's some really interesting overlap there, actually, yeah. uh, that I hadn't seen before myself. And, um, yeah, it's incredible. I think to outsiders, there doesn't seem to be much of a difference between Christians and Mormons. You know, we're kind of looked on, uh, at least in Australia, in the, in the secular part of Australia, mm -hmm. as basically the same thing. But there's some really huge uh, worldview differences there. And I love what you said about um, how that doctrine of exaltation, I think it was, yeah. is pretty similar to uh, the lie in the garden. That's like quite striking, actually. Um, yeah. And so you're growing up in the Mormon church and then eventually you find yourself uh, experiencing uh, the Theosophical Society, yeah. um, which is a really, really interesting thing. I've done a bit of work on Helena Blavatsky and the New Age movement. And obviously the Theosophical Society was pretty influential there. Could you tell us a little bit uh, about your experience of the Theosophical Society? Yeah, so um, I moved out of home when I was about 18 and I moved out when they started going back to the church pretty much um, or they'd started about six months prior and um, I knew it was hurting my father's feelings that I wasn't attending and it, it was just time for me to go as well. Um, but I was, I kind of realised at age 19, I was living by myself and I was like, I I'm, need to deal with some trauma that I have had from growing up. And there's lots of little, well, not so little things, lots of things that happened to me in my childhood um, that I had just, I don't want to deal with this, so I'm just going to pretend like that didn't happen and I would do that predominantly with drugs. Um, so about 19, I had a discussion with a friend at like a house party and she was telling me about, well, you need to heal yourself. And I think this is something that I just see. Everyone I talk to that's been in the new age, it comes from a desire to heal some sort of trauma. And because trauma is so prevalent, we see a rise in new age kind of beliefs. Um, so I started kind of looking into stuff. I, I had always been a little bit of an interest in new age kind of stuff through my mother. I wouldn't call, I wouldn't say that my mum was a new age, but she was definitely spiritual and she dabbled in other things as well, which, um, you know, I'm trying really hard to understand, but I, I think she sees a lot of things as just spiritual practices. Um, and so she, we, together, we would like read tarot cards and we would watch like medium kind of shows and, and she could see spirits. She had familiar spirits, one that she referred to as her ninth child. Um, and I used to see spirits. We, four, five out of my, the 10 people in my family had sleep paralysis 
And so we grew up in a very spiritual kind of place. And my mum always taught me we live in a spiritual realm, essentially. So while those things kind of scared me, I kind of felt like um, it's better that they're on my side. So I would talk to (laughs) the spirits that I felt around me. So I wasn't completely um, not in the know of kind of new age thought and philosophy, but it was through a friend that said, look, you need to heal. I'm going to suggest this book to you. And she suggested a book called You Can Heal Your Life. I started reading that book and that became like my Bible. I was really, really drawn by all the ideas in that, the idea that I could heal myself. From there, I started kind of looking at more esoteric kind of texts and searching things up and talking a lot with my brother who is um, has a brilliant mind. And he and I went, one night went to, probably when I was about 20, we went to see a movie called What the Bleep Do We Know? And this is a movie all about metaphysics and quantum physics. And it just blew my mind. I was like, this is amazing. When we were at that cinema, um, it was just me and him and these three other people in the cinema. And so we started chatting throughout the movie and they invited us to this place that they, they go to, um, the Theosophical Society. And that sounded really intriguing to me and to my brother. Um, and then when they explained to us where it was, it was literally I was living in an apartment, I had a, a park, and then they were on the other side. And so I viewed that like it's a sign, like the universe is telling me to go to this place. Um, I didn't really look into what the Theosophical Society is. Um, I know now that it is, um, you know, not not a great place, not somewhere I I would, you know, ideally would want anyone to go. Um, It has deep occult roots. Um, It was founded by Madame Blavatsky, as you've mentioned. Um, So that was in the 1800s. And essentially the idea of the Theosophical Society, they, they really viewed themselves as real new thought kind of leaders and they were trying to form a society where they amalgamated a whole different types of spiritual and religious ideas into one kind of melting pot. And it, the idea was that they were going to bridge the gap between East and West. Didn't want anything to do with Christianity but they would bring in um, things from all kinds of other places. The the founder herself was a Russian mystic, so she was deeply involved in the occult. And it was around the time where spiritism was like a really big kind of uh, emerging thing of interest for people. So people were holding lots of like seance parties and, um, you know, fortune tellers were like really, you know, fashionable, I guess. Um, So she founded this society and, on the outset, from what I was, when it was described to me, I was like, this sounds amazing. Like I really always wanted to be viewed as someone that was super tolerant and progressive and um, in the know of, of a higher way of being. So when they explain the society and it's like, oh, it's just a really good, great place that we meet and we discuss philosophy and uh, we discuss different religions and everyone's welcome. I thought it sounded great. So I went the next Saturday and that that's the deception of this type of place it it's not an overtly dark looking place um it it was literally like a converted house i walked in there was people just playing chess in the lounge room most of it was just like covered with books um and there were other rooms that i never really went into but it it was it looked like a library it looked like just a place where some really interesting people gathered and talked Um, And so I started going every Saturday afternoon and I met a lady there who, who I, I I pray for every day um, because I really did love her and she really did help me, but she also led me astray. (laughs) Um, And I think that's the thing with, with the people in these kind of movements, their intentions, I believe are always really good. She thought that she had some things that could help me. Um, and I absolutely kind of, I, I took it all in. I, I wanted to be there. I wanted to learn from her. And I just really took a shine to her. And she, I, I think looking back now as well, I was estranged from my parents at the time and she was probably old enough to be my mother. So there was a, a, a void being filled there as well. But she started talking to me about um, channeling um, and about auras and about all these different metaphysical practices that I hadn't really even heard about before. Um, when I first met, like when it's literally when I walked in that door, everyone was like, oh, like you completely love bombed. 
like, wow, like, you know, come join us. And did you know that you're a healer? And do you, do you realize how big your aura is? And did you, you know, all this kind of stuff. So I left that first day feeling like I'd felt, feeling like I had found something really special. And I think also being the youngest of eight children, like I'd never had that so much attention as well. Um, so I really, I fell for it. I, I really did. Um, but over the weeks, uh, I attended every sad day for probably about six months. And then this lady stopped going and she was really my, my kind of anchor there. Um, but also I'm the kind of person that loses interest in stuff. So about six months later, I had stopped going, but I would visit every couple of months. But the, what I was taught and, and the worldview that they offered me there really did remain. And then there are other points in my life where it just deepened those philosophies and those ideologies that I was holding on to. So it was through this lady that was teaching me all about, um, the you know, the first wave feminist kind of movement and how that's shaped us and how that's such a, a really great thing. Um, she's the one that taught me about Alice Bailey, um, who was also an attendant of Theosophical Society. Um, and, yeah, she was the one that told me as well, like I told her that I always wanted to be a mother. And so she's like, well, you should start communicating with your children now and then that way you'll be the best mother that you can be. And she said the term spirit babies. And I had heard that term before. I'd heard my bishop at the Mormon church talk about spirit babies. Um, uh, I remember when I was a child, a friend of my mother's had had her 10th child and the bishop had come to visit her and he'd said, oh, I saw on your roof before I came in, there's more spirit children. They were playing on your roof. So you're going to have more. And this particular lady, she was in the throes of postnatal depression and it's probably not what she was ready to hear. But because it's a workspace and because the Mormon church believe that you've got to bring those spirit children, as many as you can, down onto this earth so that they too may be exalted, it, um, she did go on to have more, um, even at her the risk of her own health. Um, but, yeah, so when this term was given to me, I was like, spirit babies, tell me more. Okay, yeah, this feels safe. This feels this, These are words that I know. And she talked about ancestors, which my mother had talked about. Um, I have memories of a figure sitting at the end of my bed from probably about the age of four. My mum told me it was my grandfather. So I would talk to my ancestors. This lady at the Theosophical Society was telling me that they were my guides. So it all kind of, it, that's another way that I just think I went from one thing to another because it sounded very similar. They were using terms that I had heard before. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So there's a lot of overlap in your worldview, even as a Mormon, interestingly enough, with this whole idea of a spirit baby. Um, yeah. And there's also some really interesting points that we could flesh out more. Unfortunately, we don't have time about how some of that Mormon doctrine is really unhelpful for that, like that woman, for example, um, mm -hmm. and how that could, yeah, perhaps put some women in danger of maybe being exploited to, you know, have more children than is good for them. And that's, mm -hmm. that's really interesting. So thanks for sharing about that. So the Theosophical Society, it sounds like um, while there were some roots already in your life, uh, in new age thought, it really kind of baptized you into that movement and you really, um, went in quite deep. So, uh, one of the questions that I had for you is what sort of new age practices were you involved in? I think you've kind of briefly touched yeah. on that already. Yeah. Um, so I, before the Theosophical Society, it was like the things I, I was mentioning. So I always read my astrology, tarot. I talked to, I always had a feeling of being watched. Um, so I would talk to these, what I thought were my ancestors or spirit guides. Um, and I now, now realize I was, you know, gaining familiar, unclean spirits around me, but you know, I didn't know that at the time, but through the Theosophical Society, it became, um, meditation became a really big, I didn't stick with that for more than a year, but that's something that's come and gone over the next 20, you know, the following 20 years, um, so meditation, yoga, um, any any kind of new thought book and new thought author I was I was following, um, but I got into more metaphysical practices. So Reiki, chakra balancing, um, aura reading. Uh, so this lady taught me how to read auras. Um, uh, channeling was a big one. So I would do that through automatic writing. And this was a way to try to communicate with what I thought were my future children and my ancestors and also just like higher ascended beings. I'd always had a real interest in like aliens. And so 
that kind of led me to look into maybe I'm from another planet. And, and a guy at the Theosophical Society had told me about the concept of um, indigo children and, and star seeds. And so I looked into that and that formed a, a big part of my identity for a while. I really grabbed onto that. Um, so that's the belief that you, st it's a belief that um, children around in the 70s and 80s, so I was an 80s baby, started coming through uh, called indigo children and this was based on the colour of their aura. So when I walked in and they were like, oh, my God, your, your aura is amazing, it was indigo colour. So they were telling me that I was an indigo, an indigo child. So I believed that. And so I was looking into all that kind of stuff. And then it went further into believing that I was a star seed. So this is the belief that um, you're not just here as an ascended kind of being to help humanity and usher in a new age. You're actually from another planet as like a, a favor, like, oh, poor humanity. They're completely lost. We're going to come help them. And this is completely just your ego just goes crazy. <laughs> but also it's a burden because... I was always being told like you're going to help people and I felt pretty broken. So that didn't quite make sense. How am I going to help people if I'm, I'm pretty lost myself um, and I don't know if I want this. And they would tell me, well, you decided on this before. This is a soul mission and you decided on this before you were born. Again, that made sense because I was a spirit baby in the Mormon church. So, um, yeah, so I went deeper because the new age is, is a real pick and mix spirituality and uh, it's completely fine to do one thing for a little bit and then move on to something else. And it doesn't matter because you're just following your truth. Um, I did a lot of things for a little bit here, a little bit there, but the things that stuck were um, the Reiki, the or or cleansing. Um, I got into crystal kind of healing um, and chakra realignment and that all the philosophy that goes with that. So really thinking that that uh, we can manipulate energy on a metaphysical level. And I'm assuming you were pursuing all that. Were you still pursuing healing? You say you were feeling quite broken. Were you getting into those practices and hope that you could heal yourself and then sort of take on that mission of the star seed and bring other people into it too? Yeah, absolutely. So it was um, all with the intention of, of trying to heal myself for exactly what you said so then I could go help other people. Because that's something I've been I've been hearing my whole life that that you're going to help people and that you're you're here to help people heal, um, and so I did. And and then that's even when I started studies to become a midwife. Those were same kind of thoughts echoed to me again, um, which I really latched onto. And so yes, so alongside the new age and new thought philosophy of trying to heal, I did go down the um, kind of more traditional. Uh, counseling um, when I was 20 22 I had uh, a, a, what I thought at the time was a really great automatic writing session and so automatic writing is obviously not something I recommend anyone do um, but it was something that I got quite good at and I would get channeled messages from what I thought were um, benevolent beings um, and some of the stuff they taught me, they they sent through to me, it would come to pass, um, which I know is just like just a massive deceit. And if if there are things around you watching, <laughs> they can make pretty good predictions of what you might what you might have in your life. Um, but on this one session, I had what I thought my children, um, and this channeling session, my my future children were telling me all these all this, all kinds of stuff. And after that automatic writing session. I remember and it's such a horrible thought, but I finished and the first thing I thought was, oh, wow, I could make money from this now. Like I'm really good at this now. Like I could start, you know, I could start charging people and I could start doing channeling, thinking I was helping, but also there was some greed driving that thought as well. Um, but that night uh, I had the worst sleep paralysis, the worst spiritual attack of my life. So like I said, I had... Uh, sleep paralysis my whole life my mother always told me it was something spiritual um, for a little while there I believed what the world says about it and they just say it's a sleep like a symptom of a sleep disorder and that made sense because my sister has a sleep disorder and those kind of things can run in your family 
And so I kind of believed that narrative for a while, but I knew deep down it was something spiritual. And my mum always said that it was. And she would tell me to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave. And I could never get the words out. Well, the one time I did, nothing happened. Um, and since coming to Christ, I I have, you know, I've been asked about that um, because I know some Christians that all they had to do was say it even in their head and it stopped. Um, and all I can think of is that that one occasion where I managed to get the name Jesus out, I was, I didn't know who Jesus was. I was calling on Lucifer's spirit brother. I didn't know Jesus was God. Um, there is an example of that in Acts 19, I think it is, uh, with the Jew- Jewish sorcerers. Um, and, and the demons say, like, you know, Paul I know and Jesus I know, but who are you? Like they, they're just kind of using it as a, you know, abracadabra, <laughs> exactly. come on out. So that's I've got peace with that. That's what I really think is, um, and, I, and I think God um, uses all the, these experiences um, for his for his good and for his glory. And, yeah, I just have peace with that. Um, the first time I had sleep paralysis again, like when I, when I met and married my husband, I didn't have it for like 14 years. And then it was the day I shared my testimony at church <laughs> and wow. I, I rebuked it. I used the name of Jesus and the power was there. Like I, yeah. Um, so that's what I kind of, but that, that channeling session, it was the worst. My sleep paralysis would usually be one or two entities pinning me down. Um, I always got the feeling they were trying to get into my mouth. Uh, there'd be like a growling noise in my ear. It was just ter- terrifying. Um, but that, that night after that channeling session where I was like, I can make money, it was the worst attack. It was probably eight, maybe more, and they terrorised me for eight hours. I mean, that that's my account. I was living by myself, but I'm talking like bed shaking, uh, the TV turning on and off, things being thrown around my room. I felt like I levitated. Um, it was terrifying. And from that moment on, I actually do believe that one of them did manage to get in at least into my mind in a big way, because from that moment on, I had constant anxiety, constant, and then constant thoughts of suicide. I'd had some suicidal ideation two years prior, and I had gone on some medication for about six months and I'd come off that, but this was different. From that moment on, that was age 22, it was like every three to six months I would feel, I would literally, it sound like, you know, the old... um, cassette tape you know that click sound when you hit play that's what it would feel like like something just clicking in my mind and all of a sudden my thoughts were not in my voice it was someone else telling me to um when I lived in that apartment to burn the apartment down um to drive into oncoming traffic to any relationship I was in like you you need to get away from like just trying to destroy my life um so yeah, I, I really do attribute the the thing with automatic writing. It sounds like, oh, I'm just getting these these lovely messages. But no, I was opening myself up and inviting them in to, to manipulate and possess me. So not something I'd advise <laughs> anyone to do, obviously. Um, but yeah, that that's where things really went downhill mentally with my mental health after that. Yeah, it's really incredible. Yeah, I definitely believe that demons uh, can influence our thoughts. I think that's pretty mm-hmm. uncontroversial, at least in, in Christian circles. And uh, that's probably good to mention that, yeah, if you're experiencing that kind of stuff, speak to your pastor, seek out professional help. But I just want to encourage people, yeah, if you are listening to this and you are experiencing suicidal thoughts, please get in contact with uh, a healthcare professional. You can speak to your doctor. Um, I'll even include some helplines uh, below in the description box. And also, if you believe it's spiritual in origin, you can also uh, add your pastor into that mix. So uh, a little bit of free advice there for you guys. So um, you're in this place, your mental health's uh, in, in a really, really dark, dark place. Um, which I can imagine would happen if you've opened yourself up to these demonic presences. You're being, it sounds almost like torture. Like I've heard people explain uh, sleep paralysis in different ways over the years, but what you were experiencing sounds particularly dramatic and and awful. Um, And so I can see how that would have taken a huge toll on you. Um, What sort of happens next for you in life? So you're in the new age, This you're experiencing these spiritual attacks. I know you eventually go to university um, and you're introduced to feminism, which you were already introduced to when you were in the Theosophical Society by that lady. So I'd love to sort of take it from there if you can. Yeah. 
So um, age 25, I met my husband. And like, like I said, from from the moment we were together, I stopped, the sleep paralysis stopped. Um, and I was really well. I was in a really well mental kind of men- place. Um, we'd been together two years and that that feeling again of um, that tape changing in my head came back and he'd never seen me like that before. Uh, by that time, I mean, we, you know, obviously weren't in Christ then, so we were living together um, and our first child was on the way, but I, um, he'd never seen me like that before. And so that was a real, yeah, that was hard because he had met and fell in love with one girl and then all of a sudden I was just really not the same person. And so I said to him, like, oh, I've got to get like get back into like the practices. That I felt like I'd backslid and maybe this is why I'm having uh, some, such mental kind of um, instability at that time. Um, so I started doing like workshops again to become like a psychic medium. Um, I was pregnant with our first and so I went and saw a medium and she was telling me about the importance. And, and this is a something I'd thought about before back at the Theosophical Society was I knew I wanted to be a mum and I knew I didn't want, I knew I needed to heal before my children got here. And in the new age, it's kind of like you, you have to heal, you have to heal lest you put your trauma on other people. And so I got, you know, into the idea of um, shadow work and healing my mother wound. Uh, these things that keep you on a hamster wheel and make you look so much inward, you're never looking outside of you for salvation. You, you've got to do the work yourself. So it's a real works-based, you know, mentality. But I started doing like uh, shadow work kind of activities, which for me, because that's like a theory, it's not so much like a practice. Uh, for me, it was a lot of like journal writing, writing uh, writing letters to my future children, that kind of thing. Um and I started doing a, a bit of automatic writing. Like I hadn't made the association <laughs> between anything. So I, like I said, I thought it was because I, I wasn't doing the things that I was suffering again. Um, so my husband being super supportive like he is, went, uh, you know, went along with all that kind of stuff. Um, and we always joke that I wasn't uh, very, very disciplined in my new age kind of practices then. Like I'd do, do something for a week. Nah, I don't want to do that anymore. Um, but when we had our child, I had really bad postnatal depression. And I'm glad that you made that uh, distinction that you're going to put those helplines and stuff in because um, one thing I don't ever want people to think is that I'm lumping everything into spiritual. There were actual physiological things happening as well um, and just lifestyle, life as well, you know, uh, had some grief and, and that kind of thing that is exasperated. Assass- I can't say that word, but I gave it a go. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> my kind of mental health at the time. So it was twofold. It was, Thank you for pointing that out, by the yeah, way. It wasn't just one thing. It was both. Um, so I um, started seeing a counsellor again. I started seeing a psychologist, started trying to talk through these kind of things. But, I mean, even my psychologist suggested mindfulness, meditation, yoga, all that kind of stuff um, because it's really all lumped into that wellness kind of pile. So, you know, I started doing um, mum and bub yoga um, and when my eldest was about eight months old, I had, I just decided I, I don't want to be at home anymore. I think this is what's making me sad. Um, and just to think back at that just kind of makes me sad now, but, um, cause yeah, I think I was being a bit influenced then, but I decided I wanted to be, find a career. Uh, I, all of a sudden I remember waking up one morning and thinking, well, what if he leaves me? I don't have anything. Like I need my own kind of security. Um, And so he got home from work and I was like, I think I'd really like to be a midwife. Being a midwife was something I'd wanted since I was like, I don't know, really like a child. And so he was super supportive of that. I ended up going to uni and uh, in the time that I was at uni, it was a three-year degree, but I did it over four years because we had our second child in between as well. And we also got married um, but those four years were really hard. Like it put real strain on my relationship with my husband and with my daughters um, because no one liked, like in our family, we just, we, we both, my husband and I both didn't feel great about dropping them off at daycare at six in the morning and then not picking them up until six in the evening. Um, 
not enough to stop it. And I think every family's different and it's very nuanced and it's, it's you know, but um, I, it never felt right. <laughs> I would drive away from them and it felt wrong, but I really, at the same time, I wanted to go find me and be me again and not just mum. Um, I just got it into my head that motherhood was a burden and uh, that it was better for everyone if I did work better for my mental health because then I'm just not sitting around thinking about myself. I'm not socially isolated. Um, we were the first in our group of friends to have children. All our friends were still very much in the drug and party kind of scene and I felt like I lost all my friends. Um, so it was hard. Those four years, we got through it. Now now we look back, we're like, we don't know how we did that, but we did. And then it by the time I left uni, I was a raging feminist. Um, the Marxist ideology, it was it was subtle, but it was there from the beginning, particularly in a degree uh, such as midwifery, where we were taught that we had to smash the patriarchy, that we were the oppressed ones in the birth work, like it was us against the the medical model, like the doctors, which was just hard to get your head around because it's a it's a science degree and you're learning alongside or learning alongside all other medical professionals so it's all very science-based yet we, we were being taught that the medical model which is the model that we're in is like evil and and we sh you know we've got to stand up for these women we've got to reclaim birth um it's a real fear and greed driven um industry um and then yeah that really shaped my worldview because it became just fighting the patriarchy and fighting for everyone who's oppressed. And there's always someone that's oppressed. I remember in my third year, uh, we came in for a lecture and we had a guest lecturer that was telling us that we were the witches and the wise women. Uh, we were the ones that were burned at Salem, like that we, they're all out, it runs in our blood and that we've got to reclaim. Like, so there's a real heavy emphasis on this kind of, um, idea of ancestral knowledge being passed through to us, that it was a, a calling on our life um, that, that and that we were to to exact change in, in this massive establishment that you, I see so many midwives come out and they're really like, yeah, we're going to, and they just get so burnt out. <laughs> like they, it's, it's just too big an industry to fight against. Um, but just the mentality that you're always in a fight was just, and so I took that home a lot. Like I was very oppositional to my husband because he was part of the problem, you know. <laughs> it was just, yeah, and it became a real um, we have to raise our children feminist. And he was not keen on that idea, but he also had suffered a lot in me being so volatile with my mental health. It was easier for him to just be like, you know what, yep, we're going to whatever you want kind of thing and I completely understand that um because I you know god bless that man he he went through a lot <laughs> yeah god when I gave my testimony at church everyone clapped for him <laughs> they were like well, well done sir um a lot of men might, may have run but he um yeah he saw me through a lot of things so he would he would try to reason with me but I was very Opposite, oppositional defiance disorder. I really was like, no, you're the you're part of the problem. Um, to the point of like, you know, not wanting to have, being grateful that I didn't have sons because how am I going to raise a man in this kind of world? Like, I, it, the, the thinking was just quite, um, yeah, I, yeah. It was yeah difficult for everyone. It put a strain on our marriage. Um, there was another occasion at uni where we had a whole lecture about how we were to be um, pro-choice, which at the time I was pro-choice. I thought that was healthcare. And it really, when you think about it now, like we're the ones there making sure that that life growing in that womb is well, yet at the same time we're being taught to be pro-choice. Uh, it's just a, it does things in your mind that you just, you know, um, so, yeah, that was my experience at, at uni and it really amped up the whole speaking to my ancestors as well because there's all that ancestral wisdom, ancestral, like part of your lineage, and call on your ancestors to, you know, help us reclaim this. So that kind of philosophy became um, shaped my way of thinking and the way I looked after the women that I cared for as well.
Yeah, that makes complete sense. Yeah, I really empathize with you um, and your experience of university here. Before I went to um, Bible college um, or seminary, I think the Americans call it, I was at a secular university studying business. And yeah, it's amazing. Even in a business degree, which you think is like maths, accounting, economics or whatever, the, the like the neo-Marxist worldview is so, mm. so entrenched uh, in our universities. It's no wonder we see the sort of political situation that we are in here in Australia today. But anyway, it's not the time or place to discuss that. <laughs> um, so yeah, your experience of university uh, and then yeah, a cult birth and um, mm. your experience as a midwife. I'd love to get into that if you don't mind. Yeah. So um, the first, so at uni, in your first year, you're kind of placed one-on-one -on -one with a midwife, which is great. It kind of runs more like an apprenticeship and, and that's, it's really useful. Um, you just, you know, uh, hoping that you're placed with the midwife that you, that you gel with. And I did, I was placed with a midwife. She was fantastic. I, I really, I, I really speak highly of her. She was also a Reiki master. And so I had had Reiki treatments on me in my early twenties and, um, but now it was the opportunity to work with her all year and she offered Reiki to all the women that she cared for. Um, and so through her, she taught me. So by the end of that year, I had my level one Reiki. I think you've got to do another two levels and then you're a master. I didn't pursue it, but that was enough to incorporate into my practice as a midwife. So that was my first year. So that was student. Uh, in second and third year, I was taught how to encapsulate placentas, um, how to make placenta smoothies, how to make placenta like tinctures and like homeopathic kind of remedies. Um, and again, it's all sold as like, this is healing. Um, I was also taught how to, I, I'd already knew how to do, read like auras, uh, but I was taught how to do like auric cleansing as well. And I remember one midwife describing it to me. She's like, you know, um, everything's just energy and we walk in and sometimes we're in these confined rooms for a really long time. Like you really need to have selenite in your pocket and you really need to make sure that you're cleaning yourself off before you bring it back home and all this type of stuff. And, and so I really held to all of that. Um, more and more as I got into my degree and then when I registered as a midwife, um, I had decided I wanted to work in the hospital. Predominantly because my children were very small and I, to be independent or work at home births would mean that you're on call all the time and it just didn't suit my family. So I decided I wanted to work in the hospital and we moved, we were living in Perth, we moved two hours south. Um, so we were quite, you know, socially isolated. My husband made that move for me um, to do a grad position at a hospital. And the, the midwives there, so I would say most of them, a lot of them were Christian and then I guess the other half were probably very much into the new age. So, but the thing about that hospital that wasn't the norm everywhere at the time, it is now, is that they taught hypnosis as part of their free birth education. And I thought that was great. I was like, this is amazing. I had read all about hypnosis. I had never tried to self hypnotize myself, but I had seen people at the Theosophical Society do it. And, you know, every, every account I'd heard about it, it was it was something like this is really going to help women in their labours and births. And um, so I did the course to become, uh, to facilitate hypno, hypno, um, hypnobirthing. And, um, yeah, I learned, like I said, learned how to encapsulate placentas. Um, but it was a real, like, midwives are very, they lend to the new age because we recognise, I think this is probably the number one reason there is so much occult activity, um, and again, that is repackaged as the good, the, the light, it's the false light deception. So they look like really nice, helpful things, and I do truly believe. And every midwife I know that does these things, their intention is to help. They really think that they've got an answer for this woman, because as you get to know your patients, you realize how traumatized they are. Um, I mean, one in three women have experienced some sort of um, sexual trauma and those kind of traumas are really prevalent when, when you become pregnant and during birth, those kind of memories are going to come to your the forefront. Um, and so I would tell women like, you know, because, you, you know, as a midwife, women would open up to you, not just on their um, physical and mental health, but also emotional stuff that had happened to them. So it was quite a heavy burden sometimes um, to have all these, realising how much trauma there is. Um, 
I think I remember reading a statistic that uh, one, the leading cause of uh, maternal death, the, the third leading cause of maternal death in Australia is suicide postnatally. So there's a real like, it comes from a place of extreme care to help these women through their trauma because we know we know things. The re like research shows us that things like domestic violence uh, go goes through the roof during pregnancy and postpartum. Like things are just heightened, and I think now it's because it is quite a very a spiritual time. Um, you're gestating a life. Um, you're about to bring forth another child made in the image of God, and the enemy prowls like a lion. He these are the times where he's going to be around because it all goes back to Genesis three, the enmity put between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, and so it makes sense to me that he hates mothers. <laughs> Um, and it's such a vulnerable time. So midwives recognise that. The other thing, though, is that midwives themselves, predominantly female industry, um, they've experienced trauma as well. So they're not just trying to heal their patient, they're trying to heal themselves, and so they will recommend anything that would have worked for them, and I know I did. Um, have you tried shadow work? Have you tried, you should probably maybe do some medita guided meditations. Um, have you tried... Uh, I remember telling some women about how they could communicate with their unborn baby, like essentially teaching them how to channel, um, although I didn't call it that. But I, I, I told them how they could write letters and then really meditate and see if they're getting any messages back, just pretty much um, channeling. But it always comes from a place of really deep um, affection towards them and wanting to help. Um, within that kind of birth world, there is always... There's also, a, because we're, we're gone through an institution that pushes feminism on us um, and we work in a place that seems quite uh, male-dominated because ultimately uh, we work under the doctors, especially in hospital, not independent midwives out on their own, um, it really lends to that kind of feminist ideology and then that goes into things like uh, divine feminine energy and talk of um, harnessing it to use in pregnancy and birth. Um, it lends itself to kind of womb healing, which in and of itself, so womb healing can just be like herbal, herbal remedies and stuff, like say for um, endometriosis or other, you know, um, physical ailments, but it can go deeper to the point of womb worship and look into the womb and the placenta as holding sacred energy and wisdom and healing properties. And this is why we see a lot of women uh, taking their placentas, uh, consuming their placentas after because they truly think that they're going to heal. Um, but there's no scientific evidence to prove that. I do acknowledge anecdotally there is, um, and I, I was an advocate for it. I told so many women to do it because all the women around me had reported really good things. It wasn't until I started talking about it on Instagram that I had all these women in my DMs saying, I actually got really sick from it. Um, and those are the lesser known accounts. But there's not one good, like, article or research to, sh to you know, prove its efficacy. Anecdotally, though, and, and you know, we're storytellers, so we will listen. If your best friend says to you, you know, it really worked for me, you're, you're going to probably try it. Uh, and I get that. Um, it wasn't until I came to Christ that I kind of, all these things were brought to my mind and I started to realise how prevalent um, new age thought philosophy was within the birth world and started to think about why. Like, why do we see that? Why is that? Thank you. Thanks for sharing all that. That's really fascinating. And I certainly didn't know like 90% of what you just spoke about. So yeah. I think that'll help a lot of the men in the audience out there yeah. to sort of watch out for these things and just be aware yeah. of some of it. It's That's really um, some of it seems strange, but at the same time, I can totally see how you get wrapped up in that worldview, um, especially considering everyone around you was uh, advocating for those things too. So okay. this kind of comes to my favorite part of the testimonies um, where we kind of get into how you sort of discovered Jesus and uh, how you ultimately came to Christianity um, in its true form. So how did that look for you? Yeah, so I would say um, it was over a couple of years. I... Um, had been working at the hospital and I had started to feel more and more like I wanted to homeschool my children. 
And I mean, that's something my husband and I talked about before. Um, one of the things that attracted me to my husband was that his parents were still married. They'd been happily married for years. And he has such lovely memories of his mum being like a really happy homemaker. And I had the same, like my mum, my mum had some, some problems and intense spiritual warfare, but for the most part, um, in between some traumatic incidences, there was a, I, you know, she, she was a great um, homemaker. And so I really wanted that. And I wanted to homeschool, um, you know, took a detour. But in about 2019, I started to really think, I think I really want to, I really want to homeschool. And we talked about it with my husband and he agreed and it just wasn't quite the right time. So we thought we'd do another year and then I would look to maybe becoming casual because um, I was almost full-time at the time, uh, pick up a casual contract and we would start it in 2021. Well, 2019, like most of my life, I'd been going down rabbit holes. Um, I think there's a real, particularly with people in the new age, um, and it's true of a lot of people, we are just hide wired to seek truth, um, to seek information. And sometimes that goes into completely Gnostic kind of belief systems. Um, and sometimes it's just really wanting to know what's going on around the world. Um, so I had been down so many different rabbit holes over my life. And my, my husband was just kind of like, you know, take, take it easy. <laughs> like maybe, maybe stop that. Um, and then 2020 kind of hit. And by the time everything that was happening in 2020, um, I kind of really recognized like there's, there's evil in this world. There is evil. There are not, yeah, there is men and women in power that want bad things and they don't really care. And I'd always really known that but it just became something that I really thought about a lot. Um, so I had gotten pretty, I'd been well mentally and then 2020 I started to have every three or so months, every yeah, three to four months I would have these episodes again of just getting really, really down um, to the point of a couple of days of just, my husband would say that I, my voice sounded different. My eyes looked different. My, my children didn't really like to be around me. Um, and then I would come good again. And then that would happen again. So that combined with knowing that I'd tried the new age stuff, knowing that I'd tried the psychology and the medication. Then in, so that was 2020, I'm feeling quite low and just feeling, recognizing that there it sounds strange to say, but I really feel like I believed in Satan before I believed in Jesus. Um, and that got me thinking, if I believe in Satan, well, there's got to be, there's got to be light somewhere. There has to be some sort of truth. 2021, I had, um, we were faced with all kinds of mandates, as you know, here in Australia. And I felt very uncomfortable about what I had to do as a midwife. Um, in the end, I decided I was faced with either termination. I just decided to resign. So I resigned and that was a very deep um, depressive episode because I realised now that I'd, I'd made an idol out of my job. My whole identity was wrapped up in being a midwife um, and I didn't know what to do without it. Uh, there were My children were still in school and... My husband was at work all day and I'd gone from working four or five days a week to nothing and just not knowing what to do with my life because I'd been a shift worker. All my friends were midwives as well and there was just like this really big void between us at that stage. I mean, a lot of them did what they had to do. Every every family situation was different um, and there was also a lot of them that that did were very resentful of the stuff that they had to do. So it was just a, a really strange, horrible time. But I started to have this urgency of I need to get right with Jesus. And I don't know where that thought first came from. I mentioned it to my husband. We were talking about the state of the world. And I just said to him, like, we've got, we've got to get right with Jesus. Like I said it as a bit of a joke. And, but then over the coming days, I just kept saying it more and more. Um, and I, I said to him, like, I've been, you know, reading some really horrible things about um, I've been reading someone's testimony about some really horrible abuse that she'd endured and then her story of coming, of, of Jesus saving her. And that gave me hope. I was like, oh, oh, 
maybe there's some maybe there's some truth. So there was definitely seeds planted um, a good two years before I came to a year a year before I came to Christ. But um, in 2020, when I started homeschooling and I met a friend, a very dear friend, she started homeschooling at the same time. And she'd been down all the rabbit holes I had. She had a very similar kind of um, background. Um, she was a nurse. And so we really just bonded. And she started telling me about these Christian friends that she had. And I, well, they sound lovely, but, oh, they're Christian. And I remember one time in the park, we were like, why do we have that reaction? Why is it? that you could say that they were any other religion and I'd be, that's completely fine. Like I, I'm a super tolerant, progressive person, like, you know, but with Christianity, I just bristled. Like why, why is that? Um, for her, she started going down, talking more to her Christian friends and she would report things back to me. So I feel like God really used just that moment, brought us together at that moment, um, obviously for his greater plan because we both ended up coming to Christ within like a month of each other. But for me, it was all of 2022 looking into rabbit holes and still doing new age kind of practices because I was having these really up and down episodes. Um, there was one time I was at the shopping center and I ran into an old colleague and this is a colleague that I used to have uh, chakra balancing with. And she invited me, like she said, like, you don't look great why don't you come over and I'll do a chakra balancing. And I was on her table. I'd been there before. I had seen the chakras many times and I was looking at it on the wall. And because of all the rabbit holes I've been going down, I had become quite obsessed with like symbols and stuff like that. And I knew a common symbol was inversion. So any kind of satanic kind of organization inverted, you know, so we'd see the inverted cross, like all kinds of inversion. I was on the table, I looked at it and I realised that the chakras, the colours were an inversion of the rainbow. So if you think the rainbow goes Roy G. Bibb, like red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, the chakras flip that upside down. And I, I remember like I felt like I caught my breath. Like I was just like, but no, I'm okay. Like, oh, that's just a coincidence probably. Like I don't, you know, that feeling stayed with me and I mentioned it to my friend Kate and she was like, oh, yeah, that's, that's kind of weird. Like um, that was in just before October, Kate had started reading her Bible and I was feeling really like convicted to start reading the Bible. So I downloaded like a Bible app. I started reading at the start of October. I was powering through. I started in um, Matthew, then I went to Genesis, I read Exodus, and then I went back to the New Testament. And by the end of that month, I had read the New Testament and then I'd gone back, back to the old. And I like was at the same time watching, watching all these um, New Age to Jesus testimonies on YouTube, which, you know, the algorithm had never sent me before, but, you know, yeah, they just like kept coming and just a lot of women there just speaking about such similar things and having such similar backgrounds um, and just the change in them was just amazing. And so I was like just devouring, like just hungry, just watching all this stuff, uh, reading the Bible as well. And then October um, I had, I was in my kitchen and I had just that feeling in my mind again, complete switch. It's like someone flipped the tape and it's just an overwhelming voice in my head just telling me like what it usually would tell me, like you need to leave your family, um, your children are better off without you, you need to leave your husband, you should burn the house down, you, you've got to burn it, like we need a fire, we need to get rid of all of this, like just persistent. Um, and the, the change in my demeanour, so when my husband got home from work, he could see it and he obviously didn't like to be around me when I was like that. And so he took the girls and they just stayed on the other end of the room, uh, end of the house. And I was in my room for a couple of days. And by the third day, so it, it, this was two days before Halloween. On the, the third day, it was Halloween. And I had called a helpline because this voice in my head was just getting more and more persistent. Um, and I was worried. Um, and I called a helpline and they sent a welfare uh, police to come do a welfare check. And I ended up being detained under the Mental Health Act. 
and taken away from my children who were terrified. Um, but in the back of that police car, I remember just like it, because the, the tape changed back. By the time I hit the hospital, I was much more coherent and everyone said I looked well. Um, so I was there for one night and then taken home. But I, um, I realized in the back of that car, I was like, for 20 years, I've been trying to heal myself so I don't hurt my children. And I've just really hurt my children. Like my children looked terrified of, of me and the way I was behaving. And so when I got home from the hospital, I was like, everything I've tried, it just, none of it works. It was just an endless hamster wheel of going around and around and around. And I would be fine for six months, nine months, and then everything would just be so much worse to the point now where my children are scared of me, my husband doesn't want to be around me. Like this isn't, this isn't what I wanted. And so I called the only Christian I knew who was a midwife I used to work with. And I said to her, like, what, what do I do? I'm like, I want to be with Jesus. I don't know. I don't know what to do. And I started just like telling her all this stuff. Like, no, you don't understand. Like, I think I've got um, like this. I'm always being watched. Like I can, I've been that way my whole life. Like, what do I do? What do I get? She was like, okay, okay. Okay. Like come over, come over. And we're going to, we're going to figure it out. It's okay. So I went to her house and she read me through some things in the Bible. Um, and she shared the gospel with me. And I, um, I had read, I had read and understood the gospel. And I remember her asking me like, you know, do you, do you believe that he died for your sins? Do you believe that he was resurrected on the third day? Like, and then taking me through Romans and, and saying, like, you, you, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, like he, he you'll be his, like he, he will save you. And it wasn't like a, she prayed for me after, but it wasn't like, I don't know. I, I know. I know now that she was really just making sure that I understood what the gospel was, uh, which I so appreciate. And so I, I gave my heart to Jesus that day. I was just like, Lord, I cannot do this without you. I have made a mess of my life um, and I can't, I, I, I feel like I just ran away from something. What grieved me was that I had a Bible in my home <laughs> all that time, like growing up. And I, I wish that I had read but, you know, the Lord will let you go down all these different paths and then use it later for his glory. So I'm very grateful for that. So that was no start of November, start of November, and that was the end of that tape in my head. That was, it was, it was gone. Um, between November and December, like I still had, um, you know, we're, we're human and we sometimes, you know, we operate in our flesh. And so I had issues with anger and I had issues with forgiveness and I had issues with addiction still. Um, I had been really into the party and, and rave and drug scene in my twenties, but at that, you know, this stage I was drinking daily and I was using marijuana daily and, I didn't think it was a problem. I knew some other Christians that did that. So I was like, no, this is okay. And then I was just really convicted, really convicted over uh, December into the first week of January of um, 2023. So save November, 2022. And I realized, I was like, no, this is, uh, for, I, I've made this an idol. I, I, I cannot get through my day without it. The first thought when I'd wake up used to be, when can I have my first smoke? When can I have my first drink? When I came to Christ, it was Jesus was the first thing on my mind because I was so grateful and I felt hope that I'd never felt before. Um, but then that would quickly be followed by when can I have my first drink? Um, so I I had told my husband over the years so many times, I want to quit weed. I want to quit, uh, you know, I don't want to drink anymore. And it never, it never happened. Um, and so... It was a Friday night and I realised a friend had talked to me about um, I still hadn't fully found a, a church yet. I had been going to a few different ones. A friend had talked to me about deliverance and I was reading through the Bible one Friday and I was like, oh, Jesus delivers. Um, I need to ask for this. I need to, I need to um, lay this at his feet and just be like, I can't do this without you. I'm tr I've made this an idol. I, and so I prayed. And I prayed. <laughs> I was alone in our theatre. It was a Friday night. Everyone else was sleeping. And I literally felt 
I, I literally felt his presence and I felt something pop in my head and I really think that was whatever was in my mind was just gone. Whatever, I felt a pop in my mind and in my shoulder and it was like just the years of programming, it just disappeared. It was just gone. And I haven't touched a weed or alcohol since. Um, for my husband, that was a miracle to witness because I didn't say anything. The next day he you know, standard time that I would reach to have a smoke. He's like, are you not having it? I was like, no, I'm done. And so he didn't say anything the next day. You're not having anything. I was like, no, 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 I'm done. Like I'm done. Like it's, I'm done. Um, so that has literally, but he describes that as a miracle. Like he, I remember before we got married, I was like, I'm going to smoke for the rest of my life. Like there's no changing me. So he was prepared for that. He didn't really like it, but that's a miracle for him to witness. He was um, stunned by that. And then from there, got tied into a a lovely church and I met a a really lovely elder there that um, just deals with all the things that I'd been through. So that knowing that I had someone to call as well that would come and pray with me um, was just such a comfort as well. Um, So I think the Lord really provided all all these right things at the right time. Um, And now here we are. (laughs) Here you are sharing your uh, testimony, uh, your new age to Jesus testimony, when that's something that helped, you know, influence you. And I guess I'm mindful of your time here, but as we begin to wrap up, um, I have here the question, what would you say to someone who was in your position? So in a similar place where they're seeking healing in the new age, um, maybe they're not finding it, they're on that hamster wheel. What would you say to a person that's in that situation? Yeah. Um, I'd say I, I completely understand. I understand. I think we live We live in a a broken and sinful fallen world Um, and try as you might, I know the world will offer you all kinds of solutions to that, but because this is a spiritual battle, the, the only comfort, the comfort that you're looking for, the truth that you're looking for can only be found in Jesus. Um, I have a real heart for people that are seeking because I know ultimately you're looking for the truth. And I think one of the biggest confusions in the new age kind of world is that they will try to teach you and try to convince you that truth is subjective and it's not. Um, It it can't be. Um, There has to be an objective truth. And so I would encourage you to keep on seeking and I will be praying that like me and like many others at the end of the rabbit hole, at the end of the, the next healing session, at the end of the next Reiki or chakra rebalancing, you'll find what the truth is um, and that it's Jesus Christ and that he he's the one that can take away and fix what it is that is broken and um, can give you hope because with the new age, it's, a, it's just a constant merry-go-round. Um, we might find hope in the short term, but it quickly fades. Um, and you can rest with him knowing that you don't have to do the work anymore apart from following him. Yeah. And man, that's beautiful. And that's a beautiful place to end. You know, I'd, I'd add to that, that truth is objective and truth is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. And, um, you will not find truth until you find him. And he's revealed himself to us in his word. He reveals himself to us. Um, I believe in even outside of that, in our experience of him, um, But yeah, look to his word, look to that objective truth. And uh, he says, if you seek him, you'll find him. And uh, both you and I have, and he's faithful to his word. Um, And he's a good God. He's a much better God and uh, master of our lives than we are. Um, And I think you realize that the longer you are without him. Uh, It's certainly what I I realized. So I want to thank you so much for coming on, Beck. Thank you for sharing your testimony, um, being so vulnerable with us. Um, I've also uh, been through some pretty dark times, and I know it's difficult to share in public uh, about those times, um, especially, you know, around the area of mental health. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, Yeah, thanks for your your clarifications about even the kinds of things you experienced and the nature of that and how sometimes psychologists and doctors and stuff are really useful in that space. I love that. I thought that was really um, just an excellent, excellent uh, clarification. And I really enjoyed listening to your testimony. So thank you so much for coming on. Um, 
And if you're listening to us here on Spotify or uh, Rumble, wherever you are, please consider uh, rating the podcast on Spotify, especially on YouTube. Please consider liking and subscribing. Um, I know people drone on about that, but the reason that content creators ask you to do that is because it gets the message out to far more people, which is obviously really beneficial, especially with testimonies like this. So you and I will speak a little bit more after this, but I'm going to stop the recording there. Thanks. Thanks again, Beck. Thank you. Thanks for having me.